Partly what I'm going to talk about is the, is the way, and I'm very conscious that I'm not a learning expert, looking and talking to a room full of people who, many of whom presumably are, and going to talk about learning. But this is how I think most of us learn, is through conversations and through networks. Uh, always has been, always will be. And what I'm going to talk about is some of that shifting <laughs> online. I'm also going to go, I suppose, backwards for some, um, forwards for others, as Ger suggested. I mean, I sometimes call my talks back to the future uh, in a couple of senses. One is that I think what I'm going to talk about and what social and the networks are beginning to afford us is the possibility to recover some of what we've lost in business. Because business was about talking to each other, about working stuff out, about building networks and relationships. And we have professionalized things to such a degree that for many of us, that's got lost. That we, are, we, are, we get stuck in processes. We get stuck in technology-driven processes. Again, I'm very conscious this is a conference about learning technologies. But I encounter people all the time whose jobs is basic, job is basically feeding the beast. You know, you've got the system, you've got the technology, you're sort of running to keep up and to just fill this thing with stuff. And sometimes why we're doing that gets lost in the game. So some of this is about returning to simpler, more personal ways of doing things. And, you know, I actually called it originally the evolutionary power of joined up writing. And Don t changed it to communication. Interesting that, because I think communication, again, is one of these things we've professionalized that we do to people. And I've always regretted the fact that social media got hijacked by communications and marketing and got turned into just another channel to pump content at people. So I actually liked writing. <laughs> and I'm also unashamedly going to talk about writing and about the power of the written word. <coughs> now, yes, you can broaden that into podcasting and video and all sorts of visuals. Now, again, I'm conscious that I favor the written rather than the visual. But the web, the internet, is based on words, text, hypertext, code, is words, is text. And the most powerful use of it is still joined up writing, as I call it. It's the idea that one person writes something over here that gets connected to something over, over here, and we navigate through that, which I'll talk about more in a moment. But it's the fact that it's about being social, building communities, finding communities, building trust, and building networks. Now, I'm guessing that many of you in the room, well, maybe I'm wrong in that assumption. How many of you have some form of social platform inside your business? So that's maybe more than half, two thirds maybe. How many of you use that internal social platform actively? Okay, so that's less. And how many of them are being taken seriously by your businesses and how much is there still a sort of uphill struggle to, to get traction with them? How many find it easy? <laughs> yeah, okay. Actually, can I have the microphone? Have you got the... Who, who, who's got an internal platform that they're, they're proactively using at the moment that would, would be happy to share a comment about how it's going? Yeah, we, we use both Twitter and uh, Facebook. Uh, and it's become more and more uh, useful now that we've got a new younger CEO. So I think it's him starting it, but we, it, it has been hijacked by the marketing and communication team. But it's now starting to develop downwards into the, the what we call the lower end staff, you know, the admin, the, 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 the facilities management team as well. So they use it as, as a communication and training. Do you mind me well. asking what kind of business? We're CIA Multimedia. We produce, we're the Northern Ireland's equivalent to AQA. We provide the exams for Northern Ireland, okay. GCSE and GCA. Oh, but we, we produce all the learning support material. Interesting. A couple of things out of that. One is that you're using standard platforms mm -hmm. rather than your own. Um, something else? Yep. Yeah. I'll come back to something else. That. Say that. So right. we have created ours. So I work in video games. And we have created our own platform, and it's working very well. well it was obviously kind of 
uh, difficult at the start yep. uh, because we had to convince people that it was also a safe place. You were talking about trust, that they could actually share and, and say yep. whatever they wanted to, to, to say. Now it's working quite well. We have uh, professional communities there, like uh, organized by a uh, child family. We have a uh, Q&A that are organized live with experts. So, and the community is also um, feeding the, 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 the content uh, themselves. So, I mean, we provide them just the, the, the structure and the platform, but uh, they are the ones that are actually uh, 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 building the content at the end. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much for that. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, we're in higher education. We have several platforms. We have a Yammer, which is hijacked by uh, marketing kind of, <laughs> self-marketing kind of types. So uh -huh. that's a re really small group. We made a WhatsApp group for our own colleagues. So that's a lot of fun and uh, uh, back channel uh, um, <laughs> uh, communication. And we use LinkedIn together and with the outside world and mm -hmm. with our students. And that's a nice channel too. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, again, just a couple, couple of themes on that. It's funny, I, one of my clients said to me the other day there that we find it easier to find each other on LinkedIn than we do on any of the official HR systems. Anybody using, I mean, there was a sort of touch, somebody touched and you're building your own. I mean, anybody using some of the big platforms like Jive or Tibber or, yeah? Hi, yeah, we're using salesforce.com, so Chatter. Yep. And um, it's interesting you said about comms hijacking it. I can't get comms to use it. They, they prefer <laughs> sales. They prefer uh, SharePoint on the internet where you can't even communicate and people don't read it. Um, sales and marketing do use it quite a lot, kind of because they have to. But we, I guess the challenge is getting everybody else to use it. So we try and put, even, uh, you know, even in my own L&D team, yeah. it's hard to get that change. Yeah. And, and, and they get the concept but it's just not in the muscle. So there's a challenge there yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. But you know, we're kind yeah. of part way there, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, that, and that, that's very much what I'm gonna talk about, is that getting over that hump. And, and the fact that there's, you know, people would tell you that this has all happened, been and done and dusted. You know, we've, we've, we've bought the tools, we've done social. Even in terms of the external facing stuff, there's a lot of companies think they have done social by getting a, a digital agency. There's another of those words. Um, that they've, they've ticked that box and it's gone away. But of course, we all know that most of the external facings done by most companies is still just baby steps and, and, and scratching the surface and not really engaging in our conversations. Yeah. Perfect. Does this, the telly could not pick it up. We use Jive and there's many pockets of the organization that use it maybe 30, 40, 50% of really well, but a lot of the organization still uses it as a repository as the experts post and the hardest thing is to get engaged active users to yeah. contribute their little, little nugget, build upon somebody else and really build the power of the tool instead of yeah. treating it like a Google Doc platform. It's interesting. And also I think another point about, it, it, as I said recently, you know, social media happens one person at a time and for their reasons and not yours. And that seems to me like a fundamental characteristic of it. So you can't mandate blogging. You can't, you can take away some of the other ways they can communicate, sort of nudge them into doing this, but coercion is really not the way. Um, and we'll go into this in more detail in a moment, but you know, people's work lives are so passive generally. We're kind of risk averse at work. We tend not to, you know, I have, I have people pushing back at me quite regularly and saying it's unreasonable to expect people to think especially at work, <laughs> you know, which I find odd, but I know what they mean. I mean, through school and university, we get conditioned into just processing, doing stuff, doing the right things, rather than stepping out of that. And actually, you mentioned about your, your younger chief exec. I mean, a couple of things around that. One is, as a silver surfer myself, I don't think this is about age. I think it's about attitude. So I know plenty of young folks who are cautious. Equally, I know some kamikaze older folks who are going for it. And the other thing is the whole idea that it had, I mean, you mentioned this sort of bottom-up thing. I mean, that bottom-up, top-down, again, is, I think, a false dichotomy. Because it's not about tops and bottoms. It's about a network which has nodes in it, some of which have different perspectives from others, some of which are more marginal than others. And, you know, the whole thing about getting your chief exec to blog, I describe in the book as like watching your dad dancing at a disco. You know, you're proud of them for having a go, but you really wish they'd sit down. And I was approached recently by a company whose chief exec was younger, was tweeting, was using whatever it was, Yammer or something internally, but was getting frustrated that nobody was responding. 
And it was interesting because he was, to some extent, still writing talk to the hand kind of updates. He was still acting and sounding like a chief exec in an organization where people were confused and scared as to what to do in response to that. So again, I think this is why it's not about the technology. It's about culture and attitudes and, and whatever else. But having said it's not about technology, I think there's also an aspect of the mobility of this. If we are increasingly using, you know, I, I still encounter organizations where they say, we ban Facebook or we ban Twitter. And then I ask if they take people's mobile phones from them as they come through the door in the mornings. And one company said yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, to which my response was, but bugger working for you then. Which I think would be increasingly the youngster's attitude as well. You know, if you're going to be that constraining, what, you know? Um, but they're not able to ban it, really. We're, we're on these platforms all the time. Again, I was talking to a senior HR director of a big company who was sitting with her beige computer switched off and her mobile phone sitting next to it and said, guess which I use all day. You know, and she's meant to be in charge of stopping people <laughs> using these tools all day. But another aspect about the mobile platform is that for many who aren't sad like me and who've spent too long too online, their mobile phone's their first experience of being connected all the time and having access to this network all the time. And the fact that you can use it just to pick up on things that are happening around you or to reach out and ask questions of other people. And that for me is, is in a sense the killer app of it. And just to sort of touch on, you know, say Twitter. Well, actually, firstly, just, let's, let's, let's go back a bit further into history and about the speed at which this is happening that Ger alluded to. I mean, my first experience of this was 20 years ago um, on a night shift in Bush House in the World Service with a terminal emulator getting onto DARPAnet or, uh, and having a look at some library of Congress databases somewhere and thinking it was incredibly thrilling to see this meaningless list of documents that meant nothing to me. But it was the first time I'd connected to other computers around the world. And then a year or so after that, my wife and I were on holiday, going to on holiday in Vancouver, wanted to get ferries from Vancouver to Vancouver <laughs> Island, went on to alt rec Misk Travel Canada, if those of you remember Usenet, and asked the question about the ferries and had four really thoughtful, they're still up there on the internet, answers from people who I would never meet, who I could never reciprocate with. And I remember being blown away literally by this potential, by the fact that can I just stick this question out into the world and it comes back thoughtfully and answered well. That's what Twitter's all about for me. You know, the fact that I know, well, two things. One, firstly, Twitter filters the incoming world for me. You know, I, I am more confident that I find out things that matter to me faster now than ever before, and I include the news in that. You know, I can't bring myself to watch television news or listen to the radio anymore, because it's so slow. And if it's about things that I know about, I realize how wide of the market is as well. So I'm feeling better informed. But it's also a resource. You know, I often tell this story, I was doing a webinar with a university in the States trying to connect, the software wasn't connecting, four minutes to go, seriously looking at the prospects of blank screens facing these people in America. Desperately looking through the help files, which was badly structured as usual, I couldn't work out what the answers were. There was nobody on the help desk. So I punt the question into Twitter and within 10 seconds, four people tell me the settings to change, right? Now that worked because there are something like nine and a half thousand people follow me on Twitter. Of them, enough of them were online, enough of them knew the answer, and enough of them were well enough disposed towards me to help me in that situation. Now that happened because I've helped enough of them over the years. So I'll come back to this idea of reciprocity later. But it's the fact that I now have that phone with me all the time, accessing that kind of support. It's also intimate. You know, I keep my phone close to bits of my anatomy that I care about. And it, it's my phone, you know? I care what gets into that phone, what takes up my cognitive surplus, to use Clay Sharkey's phrase. So I, I Clay Sharkey, so I, I um, if a manager is wanting to come into my space, they have to work harder, frankly, at adding value. If marketing want to come into my space, they have to work harder at adding value. They have to add more signal than noise because I am allowing them into what to me is now a very intimate space. So it's not, again, the passive thing of a work computer. It's my device in my pocket. 
And I sort of worry people these days by saying that it increasingly feels almost biological to me. Because I've been on long, online so long and for so much of the time, that it almost feels like some of my synapses fire outside my skull and some inside my skull. So I have ideas and I'll punt them out into the network and they'll come back bigger or better or disagreed with or ignored or whatever and I'll then reuse that to go back out. And there's this ebb and flow that feels constant and doesn't feel disconcerting because of that. I feel, actually we were talking earlier um, about being in, in situations where half the, half the room are online in that way. who are increasingly well informed and up to speed around stuff and the other half who aren't. You know, I remember seeing this even 10 years ago, more than that, 12 years ago at the BBC, where we'd turn up for meetings with maybe 12 managers and half of us were on our internal network. And we were arriving wanting to get on with work and get down to work. And we had to wait while the other half of the room did the old fashioned analog thing of saying, how are you, how are the kids, where are you going on holiday? We already knew that because we'd done it all online. So that sense of being connected all the time is a positive, not a negative. Actually, just let me just check that. I mean, how many of you use Twitter in that sort of way? You're, you're, you're kind of using it pretty constantly. Very few. Those who are not, why not? Um, <laughs> but in the sense of what, what puts you off? What makes it up? So my, my question just go hang on. Hold on. Just for the folks that are not going to be here. Thank you. Oh, I hope it's worth it. Um, my, uh, my question really was, back at you in the sense that, you know, if you're, if you're online and it's a sort of biological <coughs> extension of you, yep. how much of your time is consumed by it? Yep. Because uh, we're all kind of time poor, at least that's how I feel. And uh, I'm trying to sort of knock back things that are sure. either not a, pri not a priority at all or yeah. have a lesser priority than something I've got to get on with. Yeah, yeah. If I had a penny for every time that, that question gets asked, because it's a real one and I understand it. Um, and my answer is possibly slightly facetious, but it's enough. I have worked out what is enough time for me to spend on these networks to gain the optimum value from them. And also learning when to switch them off. So I'm guessing experience teaches you that. Yes, and output. It's ROI in the classic sense. What's my return on the investment of spending time in these platforms? Now you get better at it and you make more judicious, judicious use of your time in the right places at the right time. Um, you learn to fit it into the cracks between other other things, which doesn't mean I don't want to sit and do nothing. Again, one of the things I've learned, you know, the whole mindfulness movement at the moment is partly a reaction amongst geeks who spent too long online and are going slightly bonkers. Um, being bored is a good thing sometimes, having the space to be bored, but I can also squeeze stuff into cracks. You also stop doing other stuff. You know, that thing about being time poor. You know, I find it funny that people who will not question writing, spending their lives writing 40 page reports that nobody's going to read, or in meetings that never agree anything, will question the 10 seconds it takes to write a tweet that can change the world. So I think, I think there's a, a, a decision about that. And also I think in the broadest sense, I think the world of work is changing. In this, and this is why I started it off by saying we have processes that drive us and we're feeding the beast. I think more people are beginning to feel a strain in that. Because they're seeing this potential, they're playing with this stuff outside work and thinking, oh, I'm going really fast outside work. And then there's the brakes go on and I've got all this stuff that I have to deal with. Um, so I think part of this is about having the wherewithal and the chutzpah to start saying, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to do this. And you do it because it works better for you. And again, this doesn't mean it works better for everybody. Any other, anybody else who's a bit not 100% not sure? We did it. I'm just getting exercise here. I'll pass that along. Um, this is just a very basic question because I'm relatively yep. new to Twitter. I've been on it for a couple of years, but haven't really done anything on it until recently. Um, what do you do about the fact that it's quite it's quite overwhelming sometimes? So you'll open it up, yeah. and there are just hundreds and hundreds of tweets. Um, what advice would you give about sort of managing it? Okay. So you, okay. basically, so you don't get bored and switch off. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think there's, there's a technological and a sociological answer to that. Um, the, the technical one is that, that Twitter allows you to set up lists. Um, so I have a list of 100, 120 people. 
And I only, I never use the direct web interface to Twitter. I always use apps. And I only use apps that allow me to only see that, well, see that list first. So my experience of Twitter is 100 thoughtful, smart people who are good at weeding out rubbish. Right, so my signal to noise is really high in Twitter. When I look at the, the unadulterated stream of the world in Twitter, I think, bloody hell, you know, is that, that's what's going on. And all these celebrities that I never see. So, I mean, that's one of the nice things about these ecologies. You can manage your own, your own uh, attention and what you focus on. So there's a technical answer. The other one is I get people saying, oh, you know, Facebook is full of all this rubbish, people saying this about where they're going on holiday and blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, pick your friends more carefully then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're in control of it. You get to decide who you choose to follow or friend on Facebook. And on Facebook, again, you can set up groups and lists in ways that will mean that you only see people who add signal rather than noise. Sorry, again, I'm, I'm not Sorry. Sorry, I'm... <clears throat> Sorry. I'm not involved in Twitter, but one, a big resource that you've built up are all the people who follow you. So you yep. help them, they help you. Yep. And that's a really good kind of paradigm, and that's made the world go round, but not quite as effectively as this has. So, but how do you stop people who are following you from bombarding you with rubbish? You say stop bombarding me with rubbish. How do you stop them from bombarding well, I, Well, I, I, do, I mean, you have to be ruthless. I do this all the time. I unfriend people. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so there was a, ooh, from this. <laughs> not rudely or brusquely. Um, sometimes I explain, sometimes I say, look, sorry, mate, you're just adding too much noise and not enough signal, I'm going to shut you out. And in fact, there's a chapter in my book that I called We All Have a Volume Control on Mob Rule. And again, seriously, this isn't passive consumption. This isn't sitting watching whatever crap's on the telly. This is something you can proactively take control of. What I'm passionately saying you should proactively take control of. Because if you all turn up and turn down what you think is noise, then we will collectively get a much better result out of this. Partly steered by this, and again, you know, we've all got technology, we've got fancy systems that our corporations have bought for us at considerable expense very often, but mostly what they're all doing is just finding easier ways of hyperlinking to stuff. They're either text boxes or they're hyperlinks. I always say to clients, you know, you're spending half a million or whatever it is on this platform, it is just text boxes into which you write stuff, you press save, and it goes off somewhere. And if you're lucky, somebody else hyperlinks to it. And that's the powerful bit. It's the fact that somebody goes, he knows what he's talking about. She did this right the last time. This is what we did before. And that ability to point, and in Facebook, it's the like button or LinkedIn or whatever. But it's just that little micromanagement about that's useful. And this is back to the point about the evolutionary power of the linked up writing. You'll notice that bloggers, if they're a good blogger, will link to stuff all the time within the content. They'll be pointing to the ideas that kicked off that blog post. And it drives me nuts that even now reading newspapers online, they will do anything but link within the copy. And my brain's screaming, just link this, I want to find out more about that. But they're terrified that I'll go away and not come back. Because the reason I don't go back is because they don't bloody link to anything. Whereas a good blogger will realize that you're adding value by pointing people to the good stuff. So they'll come back. So again, there's something in there about ownership and sharing that's fundamental to this. And the hashtag, I mean, it was a friend of mine, Chris Messina, who came up with the idea because in the old days, Twitter was literally just 140 characters. So even the at sign was people like me using it regularly enough that Twitter eventually incorporated it into the platform. And likewise, Chris said, why don't we add some metadata to our tweets that says this tweet is about X, Y, or Z? So we'll use the pound sign. It's actually Stowe Boyd who called it the hashtag. Little thinking that seven years later, it would be on hoardings for adverts. It would be, you know, when my kids are annoyed with me, they go, hashtag annoyed, dad. <laughs> and I then annoy them even more by saying, yes, did you know it was my friend Chris who invented that? But, um, but the point about the hashtag, it allows us to organize. You know, I used to be burdened with the job title of Director of Knowledge Management for the BBC and had so many conferences about managing knowledge and taxonomies and librarianship and all that stuff, which has its place for your regulated, documented stuff. You need that. You need to do it well. But the hashtag lets us all congregate around topics like the hashtag for this conference. Like yesterday, I was sitting at home with a bad back feeling sorry for myself, but following the hashtag for the conference. 
able to see people just making sense of it. And out of that, I got a pretty good sense of what was going on here yesterday. So it's again, not formal, not centralized, not managed. It's haphazard, nobody sets up what the hashtag should or shouldn't be. It's messy, but it works. Now the whole process, this was beautifully captured by a guy, Dave Weinberger, who called it writing ourselves into existence. And it's, the, it's a number of things. It's the fact that when you have somewhere like Twitter or even Facebook or your blog to write, you start to notice more. I'm constantly, I've got little notepads. Well, and again, actually going back to the point about not having to use technology, I use my little Rodia notepad, and in fact, a fountain pen, because that's what I like writing on. And I'm more likely to write on that. The fact that I then go back home and take a photograph of it and stick it into Evernote, maybe that's slightly geeky, but it's, it's the fact that I'm just constantly noticing stuff. I think, oh, I might write about that. Now, if I didn't have the place to write, I wouldn't notice so much. So I'm curious, I notice things because of this. And if I do a half decent job of writing it, people notice, come back, blah, blah, blah. So it's that evolutionary process that again, as an individual, I think is incredibly powerful. Building networks and relationships was largely what it's about. And back to this idea about you network with people that you trust, who you think add value, they see you doing the same thing. So again, going back to my kids, my kids will, when they're annoyed with me, say, oh no, dad, you don't have any real friends, you just have internet friends, right? <laughs> Well, we went to the States over the summer for three weeks and stayed with two of my internet friends, one in Boston, one in New York. And one of them was one of the guys who wrote a book called The Clue Train, which was very influential in all this stuff. Both really smart, really nice people. Their partners were lovely, the families were lovely. I've met them in face-to-face -face situations half a dozen times over 14 years, but I count them real friends. I know them better than people I've worked with for that length of time. I know them better than neighbors that I've been near for that length of time. And my kids had the good grace to say, you know, Dad, your friends are really smart and really nice. And I said, yes, I just have higher standards than you and mine are further apart. <laughs> but the point is that seeing the signal in the noise, finding the people who know what they're talking about, does build you phenomenal networks and build trusting relationships. Such that, you know, there are people here in the front here I've sort of know online, but I haven't actually met before. Um, but I feel like I, I, I know them in a sort of weird way. And I think that's partly what we're talking about within our organizations. Why I did what I did inside the BBC with these tools was John Burt had kind of swept in with business efficiency and got us all playing at shops instead of having conversations with each other. This allows you to rebuild these networks and relationships. And that gives you agency. You know, it's not just some nice to have fluffy communication-y, it's about doing stuff doing stuff better, faster, for less money. It's very work-focused if you do it right. And again, this is partly what goes wrong because it's seen as a comms channel or it's, it's seen as something extra. But actually, if it helps you make smarter decisions faster, that's what you're doing it for. But also, it then starts to feed back into the real world. I love this quote from Bukowski. That it holds up a mirror to us. You know, going back to the agency thing, I thought it was fascinating the way with the Scottish referendum, for instance, that this supposedly apathetic, apolitical citizenry suddenly became very active and very animated and caught Westminster and the media totally on the hop. Not in it wasn't driven by social media, but it was fueled by social media. It was enabled by social media. And I'm saying to more and more of my corporate clients, that's your staff in five years' time. You know, they're increasingly online, they're increasingly using these tools, they will use them to work out how to do stuff better. And you standing there going, but, but I'm in charge, is gonna start wearing a bit thin. Likewise, Je suis Charlie, and the way the, the hashtag, I mean, it must be so rewarding for Chris to know that the hashtag is enabling that kind of collective cultural sense making. And I thought it was, I thought it was one of the first times that there was a maturity about it that people were just making sense and working out. Yes, there are extremes and there will always be extremes in life, but online we're starting to deal with them. Now, to go back to the technology, it doesn't, I, I can be sometimes a bit anti the big platforms, because I think the risk is you end up running a technology project rather than thinking about what you're gonna use it for and seduced by the technology. But in a sense, it doesn't matter what you use 
to do this, so long as you've got something. You can even do it with SharePoint, I believe. And I also think it's all about learning, frankly. Even learning what film to go and see at the weekend or learning what the best place to go on holiday is, whatever. I mean, the whole thing is about learning. So again, conscious I'm talking to a room full of professional people involved in learning, I find it frustrating, to say the least, that it's not being taken seriously enough. You know, I'm learning more now than I ever have in my life. I'm becoming like a sponge. I'm more like I was when I was a kid. Actually, I'm just soaking stuff up through podcasts and blogs. And I said, having worried you about this being biological, I'll now worry you more that I now follow pen bloggers and pencil bloggers. And there's a podcast that I listen to, which is three guys getting way too interested in pencils and different types of pencils and different pencil sharpeners and the, the wood and the smell of, you know, I'm, you know, but I'm letting this into my head because it's just fueling an interest. We could be tapping into that in our organization. We should be tapping into that in our organizations, but it's a different way of learning. And it, go on. Just out to the right phone. All right, yeah. And a, bit of, a, bit of, a bit of neuroscience behind it, but it's incidental learning is the most powerful form of learning. So you're living you're, you're yeah. a pen and you're learning something else. That's right. Pierre, Pierre de Chardin, writing in the 30s, talked about what he called the noosphere, because it was at the time that radio was suddenly getting really big, and the noosphere was the ideal like stratosphere, atmosphere. The noosphere was this layer where ideas propagated around the world. That's what I think we're seeing. And the podcasting thing's interesting because I, I now do my own podcast with a friend, Megan, in the States. And Megan and I would have regular Skype calls where we'd just be working stuff out about what was happening, what we thought of it. And one day I said, why don't we just record these and let other people listen in on these conversations? So we don't get all smashy and nicey about it. We just put a jingle on the front, jingle at the back, put it on the internet. And people have said to me that they listen, and some really interesting people who listen to it have said they're walking the dog in the mornings. And because we're doing it conversationally, they'll start trying to chip in. <laughs> so they'll, they'll find themselves walking the dog just talking to themselves. You know, to but that's intentional, you know, because it's not us saying we are experts in this. It's us, but the phrase is being used nowadays called working out loud. We're thinking out loud. We're just working stuff out in public. Huge potential to do that inside organizations rather than saying, I'm the expert. Here's the answers. Learn from me. Now, there are challenges to this that are not inconsiderable. How are we doing for time, by the way, Gar? Uh, it's 26 now, so till 15. OK. Um, this was one of my bigger, actually, I might as well say it. it was somebody in the United Nations who said this. And that, sort of going back to what, what we were talking about earlier, is one of the biggest challenges. How do I have the temerity <laughs> to say what I think? in front of my boss, my boss's boss, my peers. What if what I think is wrong? What if somebody disagrees? What if, you know, there's a lot of courage that it takes to stick out things into that kind of a network. But there's also a skill to asking questions that doesn't make you look stupid. You know, you can say, oh, I've noticed this. It's interesting that, what do you, you know, and suddenly that just opens. You can even write blog posts that say something that are in a sense a statement, but are also not a talk to the hand statement. They're opening up, that are questioning, that are provoking people. And then offering answers, and the word offering is deliberate. It's just offering, I think, I've seen this, I noticed this, whatever. There's a lot to do with language in this. You know, I find it funny having studied drinking rather than literature at St. Andrews, that I now find myself writing book, reading books rather about poetry just to try and get better at getting the right words with the right tone to trigger the right reactions and responses. And it's not marketing copy. You know, it's not, I hate when people talk about content marketing. I kind of wake up at night in sweats thinking, God, is what I'm doing really content marketing? Well, I'll come back to intent later, but the intention is to trigger some interesting thoughts and some interesting conversations. Some of the behaviors behind this that we find difficult are curiosity. You know, one of my biggest sadness is that curiosity gets beaten out of people at school, university, and then work. But this is about going, well, that's interesting. Why is that happening? Why has that happened again? Why do they behave that way? That kind of constant questioning. And it's not doing things by committee. It's not having to reinvent everything all the time. It's just having your curiosity nerve developed. Another quote, I'll give me a moment to read it.
we tend to focus this sort of activity outside ourselves. But actually, the things that screw you in work are the things that are about you and about your relationship to other people. And as Gerald was saying, I'm sort of increasingly getting to a more senior level of people talking about this stuff. And it is about self-awareness and, and leadership and being thoughtful about your interactions with other people. And the thing about online, it's funny, because if, if you're used to throwing your weight around in an office with a closed door and acting like a boss, you try doing that on an online forum seen by the whole organization, and people will start calling you on it and saying, hang on, you can't, you can't behave like that. Oh, I didn't know. I've done it for the last 20 years. <laughs> Nobody ever said. And you build trust. You know, I think building trust is what this is all about, trusting, trusting the network you're talking to, trusting their responses, and a lot of tolerance. You know, this is sometimes tested online. You know, the, the internet lets you see parts of the world you'd probably rather not on a regular basis, and I have to sometimes, you know, say you post something into Facebook, and I have some great conversations on Facebook, but there's the day when the first, que the first comment is from somebody who completely misunderstood what I tried to say, and the whole thread just takes off this horrible path that's not where I wanted it to go. Now, I, th I then have to take on board that it's up to them. That was, that was how they read what I'd written. I need to try harder to write it better the next time. But you're just tolerant of that, bifurcation. And again, this is what doesn't happen at work. You know, you're you've got the temerity to write something in your internal social network, and some manager come piling in and say, well, you shouldn't be saying that at work. So you just retire back into your shell and think, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. So having tolerance and trust in the people that, that you've employed. You know, this is something I find fascinating as well. It's a typical managerial position that the staff or this bunch of untrustworthy, unruly morons who are trying to take the business off its not, you know, well, who employed them in the first place? <laughs> you know? Go on, get me, let me get the mic. She's good. One of the, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there you go. One of, your point, one of your points earlier on was why aren't people using social media? Yep. And you've highlighted it. Um, I'm not going to say the company I work for, but they have a policy that if you are, um, joined in some way to social media and the company, they can pull you in on it. Yep. So if you comment on something, and that's basically turns everybody off and says, don't want to, don't want to get involved in that. No, I know. But it makes you feel good. Yeah. Well, go on. In a, um, we're an organisation that doesn't use Twitter, and I think there's a, a fear of um, a lack of control around it. Yep. What you've been talking about it's, is quite a personal um, gain from Twitter. Yep. I wonder, as an organisation, is the merit in just putting it... There's a feeling, I think, that we need to control it, and it isn't something that can be controlled. Yep. So is it best to just provide that platform and, and have the trust that it's going to be productive in a, in a way that benefits everybody? It's interesting. Pe people consistently fear loss of control, but actually they've never had control. They could never say what I could say in a pub. They, could not, you know, they didn't know half of what we were saying. So they had the mechanisms that meant they felt they were in control, but with this, they have the opportunity for influence. So they can see what's going on. They can see where the tension is, see where the hotspots are. And then they can, if they're trusted and have built up a network that thinks well of them, they can come in and influence. So I think, again, we're seeing this shift that the chances of you know, and I was a senior manager myself. The chances of being able to say, well, you just have to do because I'm in charge, that's wearing a bit thin. Um, but but being, being able to, well, I'll just come up to the back in a second, but, but security, I mean, I get asked to speak to audit groups and risk groups all the time. And they'll write their policies, bury them in some SharePoint server somewhere that nobody bloody knows what the rules are until they break them and get jumped on from a great height. So I'm saying to them, well, blog about safety, blog about risk. Get good at blogging about risks such that I go, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. I'll avoid doing that. You know? Just saying we didn't see any Google Glass anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so how about, you know, you, you, depending on the quality of the individuals of the organization, that will change as well, the kind of degree of toler tolerance. Yep. So if you, if, since you have a bunch of reactive... <laughs> 
yep. uh, complaining individuals and how much uh, you, you also have to understand how, um, yeah. how to create appropri appropri appropriate forums to kind of yes. manage the level of noise and yes and and it, and it can go wrong i mean it, it, you know i can i try to avoid being a bit of a cyber utopian i mean clearly there are downsides to some of this and the potential for it but a you're at work well two, a couple of things people are worried about people inside work running amok and misbehaving the great thing is to get you get to find out who your morons are Seriously, I mean, what's not to like? They've just put their hand up and gone, sack me, you know? Um, one man's troll is another man's freedom fighter is another aspect to it. So some of the behaviors that can look problematic, we learned this at the Beeb inside the Beeb, that some of the stuff that was edgy was worth waiting for a bit and just seeing where it went because it was very often a symptom of something that was more important. But if you do get people who are genuinely misbehaving and wasting time, then you're still a manager you know, you're still allowed, it's your business. Or even externally facing, I was doing work with the Nuclear Fuels website years ago, and they had a bunch of people trolling on their comments. Not anti-nuclear fuels, bizarrely, it was a group of Americans who were really pro-nuclear who were jumping on anybody who was anti. And I said, it's your blog. You know, you can ban them from your blog if you want. Nobody's going to be, and if you do it for the right reasons and you explain why you've done it, everybody else will go, yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you finally got around to getting rid of them. Come. I need to watch my time a wee bit with this. But. Uh, it's just a quick one. So on, on the trust side of things, I get as an individual, uh, if I publish things, I'm responsible for yep. what, what I'm putting out. When I'm working for uh, an organisation, uh, sometimes it's not about whether that organisation trusts me. It's about whether that organisation believes what I write will comply <laughs> yes. uh, with the regulation and the law uh, that is imposed upon that company. Yes. What's, what's your solution for that? Well, for a solution, that's a big, that's a big ask. Um, another story. Um, actually, working with the United Nations, um, Alessandra, who's now a friend, she runs, the, well, she used to run the UNHCR Twitter account, one in a quarter million followers in an environment where saying the wrong thing could have huge consequences. She makes no bones about the fact that it's her who's writing it, so it's clear that she's the one. But the big challenge for all the people I've worked with, and I sort of run stuff for their comms people, is managing backwards into the organisation for the sorts of reasons you've just given. And more and more organisations are trying to be 2.0 outwards when they're not even 1.0 inwards. So they can't even work out whether you've done is the right thing or not until it goes wrong. So there's a real tension in that. And it does feel very vulnerable for the individuals who are out there. So they all build their own covering fire and their own networks to try and keep themselves safe while they do it. And in fact, one of her colleagues did a tweet. It was about um, the Director General of the UN saying something about pursuing a one-state solution for Palestine. Some, I'm gonna, my politics is going to let me down here. It was an extreme statement that was wrong because she'd got the number wrong. And it blew up, it was on Mashable, it became a big story. But basically the UN were big enough to just go, did you really think we meant that? And everybody went, no. <laughs> you know, so again, again, it's like Dave Weiner who invented RSS, who grumpy old sod, he once said, if you don't want me to slag off your product on the internet, don't have a shit product. <laughs> and there's a degree of truth in that, and it's a kind of bottom line that sort of answers your question. Another quote, about gentleness, I guess sort of relates as well. It's like even down to people who make this stuff work in business, when you ask them what they're doing, they just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, you know, I'm messing about, I'm not, you know, it's understated. So I think being understated, being gentle, and allowing things to flourish, again, is a shift in management style. This isn't about making things happen, it's about allowing things to happen that are trying to happen, which is quite a different stance. In the spirit of generosity, giving stuff out and making things flow. I mean, it's a bit like, I was talking about energy management the other day. Now, this is all about pump priming situations so that more energy flows. It's like knowledge flowing, you know? And whatever can you do to make that happen? And reciprocity. I'll, how long have I got? Time? Um, 20 minutes. Good, 20 minutes. I mentioned the thing about poetry. Tone is really challenging. You know, quite often working with senior people, 
I say to them, it's a bit like trying to remember how to talk normally. You know, we've got so used to talking management bollocks, for want of a better phrase. We've talk, we, we talk in the third person. We, we use aloof, disengaging, disembodied language. And the working out of your own tone matters. I mean, in the early days of blogging, people talked a lot about authenticity and finding your authentic voice. I think that's a, a challenge for people in management, frankly, is just having the confidence and the courage to say things plainly and say what you really mean is actually ridiculously difficult. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, one of the guests on my podcast is going to be Stephen Quest, who's the director of IT for the European Commission. And Stephen's really interesting on the challenges he faced in that you know, head of technology meant to know all the answers, beginning to think out loud and doing it in a language that engaged other people. So the tone is really, really key. But the biggest thing is intent, sort of underneath a lot of what we've talked about. What is my intent with doing this? Am I writing this tweet to look smart? Am I writing it to get loads of followers? Am I writing this report to get my boss to do blah, blah, blah? And again, in a network, other people will work out your intent. They will sense your intent. And if you're doing things with a sense of generosity and reciprocity to just generally move things on and make them better, it works. If you don't, people start to take you back out of their networks again. So it's back to that mob rule control thing. We're all making little micro judgments about who we, do, who we pay attention to, who we don't pay attention to. And concision is part of that. Um, yeah, I'm sort of known for writing short blog posts. Uh, it's partly laziness. It's partly because I get bored myself after about half a page. But it's also because I know I'm intruding into other people's time. And I want to make as much, add as much value as quickly as I can. And so I'll read some bloggers who will write, you know, they fact, basically essays. I said, oh, come on, you, and it's not that I don't like reading long things. I read more books now than I've ever written, read. I mean, I like reading long form stuff. I like reading long essays. I like medium for this reason. But it's about being appropriate to your intent and your platform. So if you want to, if you want to get an idea across, do it concisely, just enough for the topic or the situation. Oops. Um, and this thing about making judgments about who you follow. It's a bit like lobbing pebbles into a pond and you get better at lobbing bigger pebbles into the right ponds such that you begin to build these ripples out with these networks. And then learning through those networks, using them as a cipher and a filter to suck in and ebb back out again. Now, I think, and this is partly a plea to people involved in training, learning, whatever, people need help with this. Some of you have said you need help with this, but I think if we're going to grow this muscle, we need to help people overcome the humps that were talked about. We need, sometimes we just need to give them help with the technology. You know, quite frankly, I mean, I heard of a senior exec at a big company the other day who had to quit and reopen his web browser because it was the only way he knew how to get back to the Google search page. <laughs> That's not that unusual. So I think a degree of the effort, obviously appropriate to your circumstances, within the training and development departments of organizations should be focused on this. And part of the comms activity should be focused on this. Instead of communicating for people, help them to communicate better amongst themselves. Instead of training people, help them better to learn from themselves or learn from each other. And I, again, I watch the, the, the ball of social being batted around different bits of organizations. You know, is it technology? Is it communications? Is it HR? Is it blah, blah, blah? The answer is it's like the telephone. It's all of them. But each of you bring a different perspective to the party. And I think, given that I said earlier that I think it's all about learning, I think training and development ought to be, maybe alongside HR, both of them keeping technology back in the box, leading this. And it's also about modeling behavior, you know? I mean, I have people who say, you know, I've maybe gone in and done some workshops for them and I'll go back and say, how are people getting on with the blogging inside the business? And, oh, they're not using it. Well, are you, how are you getting on? Well, I'm, I'm not using it, I'm too busy. Well, that's why it stopped, it stopped happening, you know? I mean, that's partly why I got so involved in it, because I saw this amazing opportunity 
And I thought, well, it's not going to happen unless I get off my backside and start doing it. And keep doing it, you know, because sometimes you get down. I mean, I've been, I've been blogging for 14 years, three times a week nowadays. And I think, oh, what have I got to say that I haven't said before? But I'll just ping it out there and stuff will just happen. New people will come up. It'll just make a difference. I'll move on. So it's that, that's, that's important. And then you get into this idea that we are using this to establish culture. We're working stuff out, like you just with Charlie. And corporations go on about organizational culture. I heard the horrible title of culture manager the other day, or head of culture. How, where do you even start with that? It's like, it's, like, it's like employee engagement's another one that winds me up. Sorry, I'm getting my grumpy old man mode here, but it's the thought of some manager who hasn't met his monthly quota lunging at me in a canteen. <laughs> I don't want to be engaged with. Um, but these tools allow us to do that. You know, somebody inside the Beeb said that our platform, which we spent 100 quid on the software, had done more to establish a one BBC culture than any of the corporate initiatives that we'd seen. But we did it one post at a time, one answer at a time, one little micro, well, that's interesting, at a time. That's how culture actually gets established. And knowledge is power, you know, I mean, that knowledge is power used to mean that holding on to it made you powerful, and only giving it out on special occasions to special people made you powerful. Nowadays, giving it out, moving it around, being seen to know what you're talking about, helping other people to get smarter, that's what makes you powerful. And it will challenge the status quo. You know, there's no point making bones about it. This is disruptive. There's no point in doing it if it's not disruptive. You know, it's like a blog last year, I said, do you want transformation or just tinkering? Because most organizations actually just want tinkering. But arguably, this digital thingy is not just affecting what we do in terms of talking to each other, it's affecting whole industries. You know, whole sectors are going to be fundamentally changed by what we're seeing now. So it's not a nice to have. Um, and if you're not going to start engaging actively in your own disruption, Somebody else is going to do it to you. So I think it really is becoming a business imperative to do this. And it's about getting better at doing stuff, but with responsibility, and this is individual responsibility as well. Being responsible for what your impact is. <coughs> taking, taking consequences seriously. Last couple of thoughts. Um, it is about building your own personal brand. I don't like the phrase, but it's about your credibility, your trustworthiness, your perceived worth is actually what this is about. And as more and more of our workplaces become more volatile and the chances of being ejected increase by the day, this is going to matter more and more. So how good are your networks? How well are you trusted by them? How effective is your personal brand? And the last quote, the absurdity in work is just staggering. We continue to do things that don't work, that we all know don't work and sit uncomfortably in meetings thinking, am I the only one that thinks this is mad? But we keep doing it, and it, it is increasingly absurd. So that was, just, that was my bit finished. <coughs> Could you just take some thoughts and comments from there? Yes. First, let me thank you, thank and you. I want a big applause. So there is some time for questions, and uh, please raise your hand. I will come over you. And all, all reactions and violent disagreement. I'm yeah. quite happy with that. And, and in the meantime, I did some research. Please uh, give your reaction on the word Batman. Then I will Bat look for Batman. Batman. As in no, 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 no. Batman, Batcave. Does it? Oh, sorry. Does it yes, ring a bell? Yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry. I had a basement office in Television Center. Um, and we would sit in there with watching a, this network morphing and forming and scandal taking off and stories spreading, whatever. Just fascinating to watch my organization sort of working this stuff out from inside. And somebody referred to that as my back cave that I was sitting down there pressing buttons in some swim galley sort of way. But yes, that was that. Questions, remarks, things to share? Please, yes, okay. Look on, uh, save me the run. If you were going to advise a sort of Twitter slash Facebook slash maybe not so much LinkedIn dinosaur on sort of just to dive in and sort of yep. work around, what would, you, what would your one bit of advice be? Well, funnily enough, LinkedIn is where all the dinosaurs are. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, actually, let's just touch on LinkedIn. I mean, I've been there, I realised I've been there for 10 years the other day. That's like, you know, nearly a fifth of my life. And I'm still waiting for it to get interesting. Um, lurk is the first step. Get better at observing what's happening in whichever space you're... See where the energy is. I often say this to people as well. Instead of building some fancy new system, just try and work out where people are already beginning to, to do this. I had a great story recently from somebody who was asked to do a communications audit for a big organization to find out how to improve their communication. She found a sizable group on Facebook having cracking work-focused grown-up conversations, told the company, and they shut it because they're not allowed to use Facebook at work. <laughs> But that first instinct to just watch what's out there and watch what works, find people who you resonate with, find the odd blogger who seems to be talking sense and see who they link to. And start, it can be disheartening. I mean, it was much easier in my day because there was far fewer of us. It was a much smaller ecosystem and the chances of having impact were far greater. Um, but it is just that thing of just starting to write and, and, and writing in the right places. Writing in the places where you're more likely to get some kind of reaction and then responding to that reaction. Don't even small things like, I hate those little Twitter, uh, LinkedIn endorsement tag things because I get endorsed for things I've never done. <laughs> but what I've started doing is if somebody does that, I'll go back and I'll email them and say, look, I'm really sorry, I can't recipro reciprocate because I'm a grumpy old man and I don't do it, but I'll buy you a coffee sometime. So I get, I get, and they go, oh, okay, let's, let's meet up and see, or just let's have a Skype call or whatever. So it's just those little signs that somebody's found something you've written interesting enough to make the effort. Just react and go, hi. And, and you find this, I mean, it's people like, I was going to say authors, I suppose I am one, but you know, people, fam proper famous people, love this because they just can start to react. Paolo Coelho's great on Twitter. He's constantly bantering with people all the time. So find people like that. Okay, so it's also about experiment. Yeah? Take, yeah. take a dive, Tink maybe, yep. maybe find somebody else uh, to do it together with you to start. Uh, yeah. Could be a good one. Every... Chap over here, Carl. Other questions? Yes. Cheers. It's just a comment actually in response to uh, uh, something the lady said earlier about uh, whether companies should, uh, should get involved in things like Twitter and what have you. I work for a um, very customer service focused company. Um, and we actually use Twitter as a channel for customer service. Yep. So where people will quite often complain about a service on a yep. social platform rather than address the company directly, yep. we'll pick up on that, respond to them, but actually solve their problem yep. as well. Yeah. And it's, it's an incredibly powerful thing. Fantastic. And it's interesting going back into the history of that, because it was a guy at Comcast in the States, I've forgotten his name, no, I don't him, who basically suddenly appeared on Twitter. And a lot of people were beating Comcast up regularly on Twitter. And he just decided to do something about it and started responding. And because it worked, he then formed the team behind him and it grew. And then I remember watching uh, Fergus Boyd doing it with Virgin Airways as well, because they were one of the first who said, I'm Fred at Virgin or whatever, a bit like my friend at, at, at the United Nations. So it was a person behind the stream. It's going to be interesting to see how it scales as well, because expectations were lower in the early days. Just answering was a good start. Um, that's going to get tougher as it scales, I think. But yeah, it's still a good start. What's interesting is how you push that back into the organization, though. Yeah. Thank you, Ewan. That was excellent. Pleasure. Um, I'm so, I'm so relieved. Because <laughs> <laughs> he would have said if he would have said if it wasn't. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I might tweet something saying it wasn't that awful with yeah. you and so on. Um, in, in terms of contributing, the blogging and setting a blog up for some people is just too much. Yeah. Um, write a comment. Yeah. Comment on something. Be public and actually say I yeah. saw what you wrote and I think this is great. And that's yeah. all you need to do. And it's yeah. that little steps thing. And when you've made enough comments, then you'll be willing to totally. write a longer comment. And yes, I mean, I, I have a lot of fun in Facebook. Actually, it's worth saying that as well, because I still have my blog, and I'll always have my blog, because that's my space on the internet. But blogging's less busy than it used to be. <clears throat> so I will now blog into Facebook and into LinkedIn. And I get some cracking conversations on, on Facebook, sometimes 15, 20, 30, once 100 comments long. And there are some people who only ever comment 
They don't necessarily offer content of their own or stuff of their own, but they write some really, really thoughtful content. Somebody said it's like watching a late night chat show on the telly and being able to participate in that without the exposure of having to have your own blog. Yeah, spot on. Okay, additional questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so mine's over uh, the amount of content that there is when people are continuously blogging, yep. uh, tweeting. If everybody in this room uh, was tweeting at the moment or writing up their blog, uh, not many of us would be having time to read it or uh, to look for it. So what, what do you see? Do you think there's an optimum amount of people that should be creating content when it comes to stuff like this, or should everybody be doing it? <clears throat> well, I <laughs> was flying in Australia before Christmas and was sitting in front of two early 20s girls who were just talking rubbish incessantly to each other and banging the back of my chair with their knees. And I'm thinking, God, do I really want them blogging? And then I thought, well, I do, actually. I don't think it should be precluding anybody. And a bit like the grumpy manager who's throwing his weight around in an office, one of the best chances they've got of being less annoying is people beginning to say they're being a bit annoying on the internet. Well, another story was actually I was in Riga and walking around this big council, big estate of former Soviet labor factory workers who are now all out of work. They're all gray, tired, drinking too much. And again, I found myself thinking, can't they all really blog and become entrepreneurial and change their lives? And then I thought, well, how else are they gonna change their lives but taking one small step that makes a difference for them? And the last story in that vein was being in Bangkok in the, with the United Nations, a big glass and silver tower, you know, a big skyscraper, with a bunch of guys in suits, perpetrating the myth that they're in control, and if they're not in control, the world falls apart. And the next day, I went for a walk along the railway tracks and the canals in Bangkok, which, as you've seen maybe on the videos, people actually live on the tracks. Incredible poverty, dogs, kids running around. But I never felt unsafe. They were all smiley, they were setting up stands to do each other's laundry or to sell each other food. And I thought, hmm, the world doesn't fall apart, does it? And even the people who don't have a voice, who don't seem to have anything worthwhile to say. And so that idea that only certain people should get to do this, doesn't mean you have to listen to them. There, You've got a hell of a lot more chance than you have of getting in on the six o'clock news. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Unless you do something really bad and then you'll be on the six o'clock. Yeah. Maybe to close the circle, because if I look at uh, uh, chapter one of the, the book, it says, The book. We all need to grow up. And can you <laughs> give a last reaction on that one? Because that's, uh, that triggers me a lot. I, I think there is a high degree of infantilization in work, uh, willing and forced, but we give up. We let the grown-ups run things back to that point about the grown-ups and then blame them. I mean, the BBC was just classic at this. We would just whinge about management all the time, but ask people to step up and do something to make it different. That was more difficult. I genuinely think we're at a period a bit like the printing press where we've got a very, very big shift in how things happen. <clears throat> I think the chances of it turning out increase exponentially the more of us who get involved in it. And networks, of thoughtful, tolerant, growing up individuals actively taking part in this is why I do these kind of workshops. So, and I think that is an aspect of growing up, of being accountable, taking action, and working through the consequences with other people doing the same thing. Thank you so much, Uwain. Thank you so much, uh, <coughs> audience, and please let's uh, close with uh, an extra applause. <laughs> <laughs>